All right, so this is Jesse. Uh, we're now recording, and um, I'm excited to introduce our two presenters today. Um, so um, both are from the Vermont Department of Health uh, Division of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs, and uh, joining us is Megan Mitchell and Tony Fallon. Um, so Megan joined the Health Department uh, Division of Alcohol and Drug Programs in 2016. Prior to coming to VDH, Megan worked for the Vermont Department of Health Access in the Medicaid program. And prior to her state service, she worked in community mental health and substance use services and for an agency focused on intimate partner violence. Tony joined the Health Department, uh, also Division of Alcohol and Drug Programs in 2010. Prior to coming to VDH, uh, Tony had almost 20 years of experience in urban and rural community mental health and substance use disorder treatment, including medication, for opioid use disorder. Uh, please join me in welcoming Megan and Tony, and I hand it off to you. Thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> We're excited to be here at the inaugural session of the Project Scope uh, series. Uh, so as uh, Jesse said, uh, Megan Mitchell, um, and uh, Tony Foland is here with me as well. And uh, we hopefully will get through the slides, um, not too fast, not too slow, um, and leave time for uh, questions for folks at the end of um, the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so let's jump right in. So uh, we're here to talk about opioid use disorders and social determinants of health. Um, we're going to start with a little bit uh, of an introduction to opioid use disorders a little bit about the history and the impact of OUD, um, and then we'll move into the social determinants of health um, and how they um, intersect with opioid use disorder um, and uh, talk a little bit about treatment and then combating those social determinants. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. <laughs> so, uh, opioid use disorders, I'm sure everyone uh, who signed up for this series uh, knows that opioid use disorders um, have had a really serious effect on public health um, and also on the, our social and economic welfare um, here in Vermont and in the larger United States. Um, there, in about 2018, there was an estimated 1.7 million people um, who had substance use disorders um, related to prescription opioid pain relievers. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, just over a half a million folks um, suffering with a heroin use disorder. And that was certainly not mutually exclusive. Um, we know that many people who um, have substance use disorders are struggling with multiple um, or poly substance use at any given time. Um, also at the same time in 2018, uh, just under 50,000 uh, Americans had died as a result of an opioid overdose, um, including prescription opioids, heroin, and fentanyl. Um, and as again, I'm sure all of you who signed up today know that since 2018, we have not been uh, moving on a better trajectory. Um, we have continued to see people struggling um, with opioid use and other substance use disorders. Um, the COVID pandemic has had a significant impact on folks um, who were already struggling or who have uh, begun to struggle with substances related to the stressors of the pandemic. Um, and unfortunately, fentanyl has become the given and the expected um, in our substance uh, supply chains as opposed to um, something that we uh, are seeing more rarely and subsequently our overdose rates um, with the um, proliferation of fentanyl have continued to climb. Next slide. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the landscape of substance use in Vermont. Um, and Vermont uh, chose the pandemic as a great time to launch our VT Help Link, um, which is our call center and um, website for um, information and referrals uh, related to substance use disorders. Um, and so uh, VT Help Link has been able to give us a snapshot of what uh, the profiles of folks who are reaching out 
to help link look like. Um, we know that data limitations, uh, you know, the people who are reaching out to VT help link are a certain subset of our population. Um, but we do think it um, at least gives us some good information about what people are reaching out to um, around health and resources. Um, and so alcohol continues to be uh, the number one substance of misuse um, in Vermont, according to the NISDA survey. Um, and when we look at the VT help link data, that is reflecting um, that NISDA data as well. So uh, most of the people, 55% who are contacting VT help link um, are calling about alcohol as opposed to other substances. Heroin is second, um, and quite frankly, not a close second at 16%. Um, and then we go to other opioids, stimulants, hallucinogens, and other depressants. Um, so although this series is focused on opioid use disorder, um, whenever Tony and I present, we are always uh, cognizant to remind folks that quite frankly, in Vermont, alcohol is our number one um, substance of misuse. Um, and that uh, Vermonters are struggling with multiple um, substance use disorders uh, above and beyond opioid use. Go to the next slide. Um, again, another slide to demonstrate that alcohol use disorder um, among Vermonters 12 years and older is among the highest in the US. Um, this is NISDA data again, 2018-2019. Um, um, and NISDA data, there is a, a lag time in the data. So that's why we're not looking at um, more recent data. Um, but if we look um, at the percentages of uh, uh, people with alcohol use disorders, Vermont is in the dark blue um, on the map. And the darker the blue, the worse um, uh, for context. And so when we also look at um, Vermont in comparison with just the Northeast, we still come out with um, higher rates of folks with alcohol use disorder. Go to the next slide. Um, so this is looking at uh, opioid involved overdose, uh, oh, oh, overdose death rates. Um, again, looking at Vermont as compared to national. Um, uh, overdose death rates, Vermont, again, the, the darker the number, the worse, other than gray, which is not included. Um, and so Vermont is not uh, in the worst shape uh, nationally in 2018, but we certainly uh, were not in the lightest pink areas um, of the, I hate to say high performers, um, but less bad performers uh, with regards to opioid overdose rates. Um, and again, uh, 2018 is the most recent kind of national data to be able to look at. Um, but we know that nationally, um, with the COVID pandemic uh, and with the, again, pr proliferation of fentanyl in the drug uh, supply chain, overdose rates have not gotten better um, since 2018. Can go to the next slide. Um, so this is uh, more recent data. Um, this is looking at 2021, um, which is preliminary data from the health department. Um, they're still crunching um, through the da data and uh, confirming um, the overdose death cases. Um, but it does demonstrate um, that again, uh, our numbers are not necessarily trending in the right direction. Um, there have been some ups and downs, um, but our overdose deaths are higher uh, in 2021 preliminary numbers than they have been in previous years. Um, the little um, box to the top right, um, the way I look at it is demonstrating um, how much fentanyl has an impact in our overdose um, death rates. And uh, fentanyl really is something that we're looking at as being the driver in the fatality rates. You can go to the next slide. So a little bit about history for opioid use disorders. Um, so uh, opioid use disorders, uh, the origins, of those use disorders are uh, multifaceted. Um, 
We have a long history with opioid use in the United States uh, and a, a, in the world. Um, in the US, uh, opioids were generally used to prevent and treat uh, pain, um, suffering of patients. Uh, we think about uh, folks with cancer, um, folks with other terminal conditions being, uh, di uh, being prescribed opioids to uh, alleviate their suffering. Um, at a point in US history and in our uh, Western medicine, um, there was a move to increase opioid prescribing um, and uh, a larger focus on pain um, and addressing pain and a movement where opioids were being prescribed for things other than um, you know, things like cancer and other illnesses uh, for the short term. Um, opioids that are prescribed that can be uh, misused uh, include codeine, fentanyl, morphine, uh, methadone, oxycodone, um, I can go on and on, buprenorphine. Um, and I think Tony and I like to make the point that although there's a lot of um, emphasis on the opioid crisis, and we talk about the opioid crisis being a new thing, uh, the use of opioids uh, has a really long uh, history in the US and um, in the world. Um, the next slide is going to show you a timeline that um, it's, uh, it's a really cluttered slide. It's hard to read, but I think it helps illustrate that um, the opioid crisis isn't new. Um, there, there has been a long history of folks struggling with opioids and with um, opioid use disorders. Um, and uh, the, again, the introduction of fentanyl um, into our drug supply chain has really changed, um, uh, changed the landscape of opioid use disorders and upped the, um, the, I've lost the word, deadliness of those particular disorders. So we can hop onto the next slide. So again, like I said, this is super messy. No one expects you to be able to read it and slides will be available. Um, but Tony and I like to illustrate that, you know, we're looking at uh, morphine being invented in 1804, um, heroin uh, being invented uh, in the 1800s as well, um, hypodermic, nerve, hypodermic needles uh, being invented in, uh, in the 1800s. Um, and as far back as 1935, there was what was called the narcotic farm. Um, which was a prison and a rehabilitation um, and research center. So again, although we talk about the opioid crisis being kind of this new phenomenon, we're talking about, about back to the 1800s that opioids were um, being used by, uh, by folks um, and uh, that folks have been um, suffering from use disorders. <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. So again, looking at our NISDA data, um, the National Surveys on Drug Use and Health, <clears throat> um, based on the 2019 to 2014 data, about uh, one in eight children, um, just shy of nine million, aged 17 or younger, lived in a household with at least one parent who had a substance use disorder um, in the year prior. <clears throat> About one in 10 children lived with a parent who had uh, an alcohol use disorder, and about one in 35 children lived in households um, who had an illicit uh, drug use disorder. So substance use uh, definitely has a significant impact on families um, and on children. And go to the next slide. So uh, people often wonder about the impact of substance use disorders and living in families where there is substance use on children. Um, and the, uh, the long and short answer is it depends and it's variable, um, but there are some factors around familial substance use that, um, are, that correspond with more or less um, likelihood of uh, harmful impact. Um, and so when we look at families where both parents have a substance use disorder um, and those use disorders are impeding parenting um, and the ability to provide a nurturing environment for the child, that 
uh, does correspond with a higher likelihood of impact on that child. Um, I'm sure everyone on this uh, call is familiar with the ACEs, um, the Adverse Childhood Effects. Um, and so substance use, parental um, or familiar familial substance use is one of those adverse uh, childhood experiences that can correlate with a higher likelihood of um, negative health impacts for uh, children. Um, so looking at, uh, at the research, um, children of parents who have uh, substance use disorders are uh, at an increased risk uh, for abuse neglect. That does not mean that a parent with a substance use disorder is neglecting or abusing their child. It is that there is um, an increased risk, um, an increased risk of uh, involvement in child welfare, physical health problems, mental health problems, social uh, skills defects, um, and so on. And we can go to the next slide. So um, social determinants of health. Uh, so hopefully uh, many of you are familiar with the concept of social determinants of health. Um, and these are how um, the uh, places, the conditions um, in which people live, learn, work, play affect their health risks and health outcomes. Um, so there's uh, five generally recognized social determinants or determinants of health and that's your gen genetics, um, your genes, and your biology, um, your health behaviors. So am I eating uh, Cheetos for breakfast every day for 20 years or uh, eating uh, oatmeal with some apples in it? Um, healthcare, um, which includes both your ability to access healthcare and your uh, choices in accessing healthcare. Do I get my flu shots? Um, do I get my uh, preventive health screenings, uh, your physical environment, and your socioeconomic environment. Um, so three of these uh, five are considered your social determinants of health, and that's your socioeconomic environment, your physical environment, and healthcare. <clears throat> you can go to the next slide. So thinking about social determinants of health, um, and we'll start with uh, healthcare. Um, so do you have health insurance? Are you able to simply access health care? Um, thinking about Vermont, where we have um, issues with primary care physicians and having enough primary care physicians, do you even have a primary care physician to be able to engage with preventative health care? Um, and if you do have a primary care physician, do you have insurance that can uh, pay for you to go um, get that uh, preventive health care? Uh, thinking about your uh, neighborhood, um, are you in a neighborhood that is a, um, a grocery store desert? Um, so you, do you have the ability to go get um, you know, healthy foods to eat? Um, or are you in an environment that uh, you would have to travel long distances by bus? Um, is your neighborhood safe? Um, is it a place where you're able to access parks um, and physical uh, recreation? Um, and then uh, thinking about just uh, socio socioeconomic and other um, other factors, um, you know, are you able to uh, be able to do the things that folks who are privileged are able to do uh, to be able to um, address health risks and or um, engage in activities that would that are uh, known to increase health? We can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, people often talk about and hear about is that overprescribing of prescription opioids is the single uh, cause of the proliferation of opioid use disorder. So while supply uh, of opioids is a factor, substance use disorders are fundamentally fueled by economic and social upheaval, um, and etiology of substance use disorder um, is really linked to, um, and especially opioids, is really linked to um, the fact that opioids do a really good job of, in the short term, getting rid of pain. Um, and that can be physical pain, that Hello. can also be whoop, emotional pain. 
All right, we can go to the next slide. Um, so when you look at data around opioid use and opioid use disorders, um, economic hardship, high rates of unemployment um, are characteristics of areas um, and communities that are considered to be um, hard hit by opioid, opioid use disorders. Um, uh, Appalachia is an example, coal country. Um, urban center cities in the US, as well as um, Russian communities dislocated um, by the Soviet Union's uh, economic collapse, a uh, timely thing for us to be talking about. Um, and so this helps uh, illustrate that social determinants really do contribute to hopelessness um, and social and personal trauma that can um, set the stage, but really increase your risk um, for developing substance use disorders. And um, in this case, uh, we're talking about especially opioid use. Um, homelessness, uh, exposure to violence um, can also shape um, health behaviors uh, along with uh, 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 increasing and, and leading to trauma. Um, and, and that can increase uh, opportunities and uh, perceived reasons for engaging in high-risk behaviors. Um, uh, education, low income, low employment opportunities, um, poor social networks, low levels of self-worth, um, uh, less autonomy and self-mastery also are contributors to uh, substance use disorders and are closely uh, connected to um, uh, uh, those social determinants, people's environment uh, where they live. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Tony talk about this one um, because he certainly is uh, more of the expert on uh, on the prescribing side of things. Yeah, I mean, if you think of just prescribing in general, folks who tend to have blue collar positions or tend or folks who have kind of lower socioeconomic means tend to be more highly prescribed to. They tend to um, they tend to receive higher levels of prescriptions. There's a, a relative ease of getting illegal prescriptions. Uh, they have a uh, potentially higher belief that somehow the prescriptions are safer and that diversion of medications as a side as a side uh, as a side um, sharing of prescriptions isn't necessarily an unnormalized behavior and individual or normalization of use is not uncommon and some of those structural disadvantages within healthcare have kind of contributed across opioid prescribing. Things like uh, psychiatric sequelae and poverty tend to, over the years, have been kind of correlated to prescribing practices. Next slide. So um, social determinants and treatment. <clears throat> so um, we'll talk a little bit about nationally, but also give it the Vermont context, um, because Vermont does look a bit different because of our, um, our Medicaid program and our um, kind of uh, forward thinking about treatment for um, substance use disorders, specifically opioid use disorders. So one of the barriers and limitations um, nationally for treatment for um, SUD and uh, OUD is a lack of quick and easy access to treatment. Um, Vermont's hub and spoke system um, has developed into a nationally recognized model um, for providing robust access. Um, and Vermont has continued with a number of initiatives, um, including rapid access to treatment um, to be able to build on that hub and spoke model to make sure that access is, uh, is readily available in Vermont. Um, another big barrier nationally, and which is a significant concern in Vermont, is the limited um, professional care to support long-term recovery. Um, Vermont's existing workforce was challenged pre-COVID, um, and uh, COVID has uh, further dwindled um, the availability of 
clinicians, nurses, allied health professionals, recovery folks um, who are available to work in our system um, and provide long-term care for folks. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, another barrier is uh, limited uh, limits to funding to pay for certain types of treatment. Um, Vermont does have our um, block grant uh, dollars through SAMHSA that we fund care to under and uninsured individuals in the preferred provider network. Um, Vermont also does have a very robust uh, Medicaid coverage for SUD treatment. Um, that is not true um, in every other state. Um, and then a limited or lack of services for families when their loved one is in treatment or refuses treatment. Um, uh, uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so social determinants in neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, so the relationship uh, among the among, among employment, healthcare workforce and rates of uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is uh, what happens to uh, infants after they're born, um, if they were exposed uh, pre-birth to opioids. Um, and it's a collection of, um, of uh, symptoms uh, for, uh, for the infant uh, when the opioids are leaving their body that they were exposed to uh, prenatally. And that can be either through uh, someone who's getting medication uh, for their opioid use disorder or through um, illicit uh, opioid use. Um, so higher uh, long-term unemployment rates are associated with higher rates of NAS, um, suggesting that economic conditions contribute to NAS rates. Um, <clears throat> higher proportion of manufacturing jobs in rural uh, counties are associated with higher rates of NAS. Um, Vermont's rates of NAS are intertwined with our high rates of treatment with uh, for with medications for opioid use disorder. So although Vermont's rates of NAS <clears throat> look high when compared nationally, it does need to be viewed in the context of our uh, treatment access. Next slide. So what we can we do to reduce social determinants influence um, in the fight against substance use disorders? Um, so, uh, if it were as simple as cutting access to opioids and other substances, we would have cured addiction already. Um, there are no uh, easy and simple answers to, uh, to the, the problem of substance use disorders. Um, and subs as we've talked about, substance use disorders are um, interwoven inter with other societal challenges. Um, so if we're looking at preventing opioid uh, use, uh, misuse and substance use disorders, we have to look at all of those factors, look at safety, housing, quality education, affordable childcare, um, ensuring people have health insurance and access to healthcare, social supports, food security, and social cohesion. <clears throat> and the importance of understanding the pathways linking these social factors to health, um, really helps us look at um, look at uh, differences uh, it within uh, the US, within states, within uh, communities, and uh, be able to uh, create interventions that really do meet the needs of those uh, communities. Next slide. All right, next steps. I think we're almost done. I'm being mindful of time here, Jesse. <laughs> Um, so next steps, uh, it's important that healthcare providers um, uh, receive training and are given opportunities to learn about um, structural competency um, in, in order to combat social determinants of health as they relate to substance use disorders. Um, and it's also really important that healthcare providers are a part of included and included um, in addressing the upstream factors um, which include uh, economic opportunities for, hope, for folks, social cohesion, um, racial disadvantages, and also life satisfaction um, to reduce people's risks of developing substance use disorders. Next. So 
This is Jesse, Megan, that's the last slide. Were we under time? Did we make it through? <laughs> I, I think you were down to the second exactly at 30 minutes. So <laughs> just wow, Vir virtual round of applause, everyone.